Mayor. Great. Thank you, uh, Town Manager Evans. Uh, welcome to tonight's Town Council meeting. This is for Monday, March 15th. Uh, per the governor's executive orders, this is being uh, recorded virtually or um, you know, held virtually and recorded as well. Um, we have the Board of Education uh, Chairman and Superintendent and Finance Director here with us. Uh, so as our guest, uh, Mr. Emmett, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance tonight? My pleasure. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Emmett, for doing that for us. And I saw Sue in here. Sue, if you would, please take the attendance for us. All right. Councillor Biggs. Present. Councillor Flanagan. Here. Councillor Forrest. Here. Councillor Hill. Here. Councillor O'Connor. Here. Councillor Pelletier. Here. Councillor Pentelo. Deputy Mayor Mazzarella. Here. And Mayor Rell. Here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Uh, as I started off, we do have uh, the Board of Education Chair and Superintendent, as well as the Finance Director here. Um, it is that time of year. It just seems like it was last year, uh, which it was, but just last month, I guess that uh, we heard from uh, Mr. Emmett and uh, Mr. Charles, Board of Ed Chair, Chairman Chuck Carey on the, uh, sorry about that, Chuck. Uh, I'm looking at your name tag going, you're, you're not a Charles. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's that season again that uh, we start to um, prepare for the town budget and the Board of Education. Uh, you guys finish up your budget a little bit earlier than we, we do. We have a um, statutory deadline of May 15th, or actually a town ordinance deadline of May 15th. Uh, I don't know if that will change this year. It did change last year. The governor's executive order extended that into um, June. We're hopeful that we don't have to do that again this year. We can um, wrap everything up in a timely fashion. Um, but this is, you know, this is kind of the, the first leg of... Uh, um, the budget process. Having said that, um, I believe you guys and the Board of Ed had voted on your budget last week. And um, with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Emmett to uh, give us a kind of a, a rundown and an update on uh, this year's budget proposal. Thank you, Mr. Rell. If I could share my screen, please. Should be able to. All right, well, while he's sharing his screen, I'm gonna start off uh, just on behalf of the Board of Education, thank you for having us here tonight. Uh, we look forward to this opportunity every year to uh, discuss our budget with the town council and to answer questions. But I did wanna say thank you to those town council members who did come to our budget workshops that we had. That's greatly appreciated as you saw the insight and in-depth discussions we had over our budget. I also want to take this time to just thank all the school administrators, principals, assistant principals, central office administrators for all their hard work on the budget. And more importantly, thank all the teachers for all their hard work this year, especially for keeping our students safe and healthy in schools. It's been a trying year, as we all know, and a very unprecedented school year that we've been going through. So if we look at the next slide, we look at our timeline. The budget draft document was a little bit later than it was last year. It was available in June, January 28th, 2021. Last year, we had it out in December, but we were still able to get our three workshops in in February, and you see those three dates. Uh, last Tuesday on March 9th, the board voted and approved the superintendent's proposed budget that you'll be looking at tonight, and we forwarded it on to the town council on March 15th, and we are here tonight to present it, and then you can see the Budget hearing coming up in April, and then you guys vote and allocate our funds by May 15th, as the mayor pointed out. So if we look at the next slide, 
we thought it was important that we start off by looking at what drives the budget. The budget drives our vision, but everyone, we have a strategic plan that actually drives it all. And those are the, the, the part, the strategic plan is what we keep in mind as we're looking at our budget allocations and deciding what needs to be in the budget. So if you look at the four values of our stakeholders, I won't read it, but it, it talks about what all four of those stakeholders have in common. So as we discuss our budget and build it, we look at those important factors. So if we look, the first stakeholder I wanna talk about is the students. They're the center of all our budget discussions. Where we always, especially this year, we're looking at what did we need to have in our budget for next year as we support students coming back five days a week, hopefully before next year, but next year, hopefully the new norm starts and we start the school year with a five day a week school year. So that was the center of our discussion. What do our students need, especially around social emotional well being? to get them back into school, acclimate it, and have a successful school year next year. The next part of our stakeholders is the staff, the, the, the teaching staff. The, as our landscape of teaching has changed this year, and we know it's gonna to continue to change next year, we're always looking at ways that we can support our staff to be successful in the classroom and ultimately help our students be successful. In family partnership, um, this year in the budget process, the board was excited to introduce public comment at our board workshop. We had no public comment this year. We're hoping next year we do, but we thought that was a great way to connect to the public, give some collaboration and allow them to have some input on what they were listening to and what their thoughts were of our budget. Finally, the Board of Ed and the community partners, we engage in the budget process for over two month period. We also get weekly updates from the superintendent. So it's an ongoing process of listening, listening and learning about our budget in being strategic and how we prioritize what's in this budget. So Mr. Emmett will now discuss what's in our budget request. Thank you, Mr. Kerry. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I, I come right up with the numbers right up front. And, you know, it's difficult this year. Um, you know, every year I like to include photographs of, uh, you know, what's going on in the Weathersfield Public Schools to kind of tell the story. Uh, and I think that this first photo kind of tells that story. This is a senior night for girls basketball. And uh, you can see that we have operated under a very different landscape over the course of this past year. Um, and ironically, it was um, one year ago tomorrow that we ended up closing uh, what, for what we thought would be two weeks and ended up being uh, for the remainder of the uh, school year for 2021. So with regard to our adopted budget, last year we came in at a budget of $56,902,759. Um, this year we are proposing a board approved budget of $58,437,718. This is an increase of $1,534,959 and a percentage increase of 2.70% over last year's operating budget. And this is a slide we show each year. Um, this has not changed. Uh, it is primarily made up of personal services uh, for salaries and benefits. Uh, this number has gone up slightly over the past couple of years. Um, other budget drivers that we have include purchase property services, other purchase services, uh, supplies, property, and then miscellaneous costs as well. In terms of our projected changes by major object, uh, the bulk of this budget is made up of contractual increases, both for benefits and salaries. Um, unlike last year, um, we are certainly expecting to see a much uh, smaller increase in health insurance. Uh, last year for health insurance, I believe we were approximately 13% uh, on the increase, and this year we are significantly less. In terms of our salaries um, in our bargaining units, we just finished this year with negotiations with our administrators union. And then this spring, uh, later this spring, we'll be engaging with uh, nurses as well as our secretary para union. So you can see some of the other areas in terms of miscellaneous, uh, purchase property services, supplies, uh, professional and technical services, and other pur purchase services. Those are areas where we have all uh, seen reductions over the course of this year and into next year. And uh, we'll have some more detail a little later in the presentation. So as I mentioned, the bulk of the budget really comes into our uh, contractual and step increases. The Weathersfield Federation of Teachers, uh, our largest uh, unit makes up the largest increase. And then we're looking uh, to add uh, several positions and uh, we're looking for a curriculum uh, in, uh, instructional supervisor for grades seven through 12. 
and we're looking for a special education supervisor position. The curriculum instruction supervisor position is one of two that we had in prior years that we lost through attrition uh, and difficult budget times. The special education supervisor position is one that we had requested in previous budgets um, and unfortunately that was not fulfilled. As you know, um, the board charged uh, administration with developing in-district programming to reduce the reliance upon out-of-district uh, placements. And I am very proud to say we have successfully done that. The process of administering these in-house programs is a daunting task. And at this point in time, I have one director of special services. I have one um, special education supervisor for the entire district. Uh, that is somewhere in the range of 500 students with special needs or with 504 plans, both in district as well as magnet schools and out of district placements. Um, so that has been a major stressor for us over the past couple of years. I also wanna make note here with regard to the little asterisk there. Um, the other piece that I had in the budget originally was for uh, summer school to enhance our summer school opportunities for students um, who are returning after being out for remote learning, uh, as well as being home during the closure. Um, we're shifting that over to the ESSER II funding, and we're looking to participate with CREC on a program called the CREC Teacher Residency Program. What we have seen within our district is an increasing level of diversity across our student body, and frankly, our staff diversity has not kept up. So the money that we were looking to uh, put in for the summer school will shift over to the ESSER II grant. And we're looking to bring in a total of two teacher residents, uh, teacher leaders of color who will come in and work side by side with teacher mentors who are certified for the Weathersfield Public Schools. They'll work with us over the course of 18 months in an intensive education program while they work side by side with our staff. At the conclusion of their program, they will be a certified teacher and we will provide them with a permanent position within the Weathersfield Public Schools. Um, we're going to fund one position out of the operating budget and the other position we're looking to use grant funding. So we're very excited about this. We think it's long overdue and a step in the right direction for the town. Let me talk a little bit about the instructional supervisor for curriculum and what that person is, is all about. As I mentioned earlier, it replaces one of the two positions that we lost due to prior budget reductions. Um, it is certainly supported by the NEASC report. Um, the NEASC uh, group came out and did a uh, mid-year, uh, mid-cycle report for us and uh, spent several days in district virtually um, assessing our programs and our curriculum and instruction. And it was clear that we need work in the areas of curriculum and instruction. And this position will absolutely support that in conjunction with the work of the uh, teacher liaisons at the high school administration and Weathersfield High School staff. The supervisor will improve student achievement through a variety of different modalities, including modeling and coaching, collaborating with teachers to improve learning and engagement and a focus on students who need additional supports. And coming off the pandemic, we are well versed in understanding that we have students that are going to need to be able to close the gap. Um, collaboration with building principals and teacher leaders to assess the current needs and develop a plan for the improvement of instruction. Again, collaboration with teachers on the curriculum review cycle. Um, in some areas, we've been able to update our curriculum and in other content areas, we need uh, some significant work. We also want to make sure that we don't limit this position just simply to grades nine through 12, because the vertical articulation between actually K through 12 is critically important. We wanted to focus it on seven through 12, given the fact the NEASC report has come out and we know that there is a significant gap between middle and high school, and we'd like to close that. And then finally, the instructional supervisor of curriculum will be responsible for analyzing student achievement data to drive improvements and move the district forward. The instructional supervisor for special services. Again, this is someone who will again identify, develop, and expand specialized programs in the district. Um, as you know, we've uh, developed programs for ABA, applied behavior analysis, a STRIVE program for our students with uh, emotional uh, challenges, and a human relations course uh, at the middle school for our students there. And these programs have done a great job of keeping our kids in district and avoiding us having to pay the exorbitant out of district tuition and the exorbitant transportation costs that go along with it. Again, this instructional supervisor um, position will increase both the count and prevalence of students with disabilities staying within the district. 
Uh, it's interesting, when I started in Wethersfield in 2008 as the director of special services, the prevalence rate of students with special needs was approximately 10%. As I'm talking to you this evening, we have passed the 15% mark in terms of prevalence, and that is something that is being seen across the state of Connecticut. And another one of the factors that the instructional supervisor for special services will be responsible for is the ever-changing mandates to special education procedure. Um, they'd be responsible for um, supporting us in mediations, intensified legal ramification, and an increase in high profile cases regarding, regarding and requiring additional supervision. Um, special education is one of those um, uh, avenues that I always talk about being a wild card. Uh, it can be exorbitantly expensive. And again, if you have somebody there that can provide an oversight of mandates, uh, and work with parents to uh, resolve problems before they get to mediation or due process, that saves the district resources and it saves the district money. And of course, is best for kids. We're looking for the instructional supervisor for special services to be able to collaborate with school teams to provide high quality inclusive practices. And of course, most importantly, we're looking for this individual to be able to help our teachers uh, decrease the achievement gap that we've seen within the scope of the district. I want to talk a little bit about these specialized programs and this tells an unbelievably strong story and um, you know one of the things we've seen with these programs both the ABA and the STRIVE program you see the number of students that it, that are impacted by these programs we have a total of 30 students four in STRIVE and 26 currently in our ABA programs from grades pre-k through six if you look at the comparative cost of an outplacement for one student you're looking for an ABA type program with the intensive supports that are needed. On average, and I'd say we're probably on the low end here, 85,000, and that does not include transportation. For a STRIVE program, for a program that would require uh, more intense behavioral supports, you're looking at an average tuition of 65,000. So doing the math and based upon the uh, uh, program net savings, you're looking at a savings of $1,591,371 for the ABA program and savings of 134,325 for the STRIVE program. And what's most important, the students that you see here are students that are from Wethersfield, Connecticut, and they are staying within the Wethersfield Public Schools. They are working with their uh, typical peers and they have the same access to the education and the quality education that their peers get. So we're extraordinarily proud of this uh, particular program. And we'll talk about just some of the other drivers here with regard to the budget. Um, the OPEB contribution, uh, this is an increase per funding policy of 78,000. Uh, our uh, employer increased the defined uh, benefit and defined contribution pension plans. And we are projecting a health insurance increase of 2% uh, based upon projections from the insurance committee. I'd also like to note that 2020-2021, uh, our health insurance budget was reduced 625,000 due to 2019-2020 budget savings. So um, we did finish under budget given the closure. We returned back to the town of Wethersfield $625,000, which offset the health insurance increase this year. In addition to that, we returned uh, $118,218 to the town, which went into the 2% reserve fund. Here you'll see some of the, the decreases in the budget and these are really based upon the pandemic and, and need. And you can see here that uh, this obviously is a photo based on one of our cohorts. I'm very proud to report that uh, all of our students in grades pre-K through six have returned to an in-person learning opportunity. Uh, as of today, we had 85% of our uh, elementary level students back in full time. Uh, but you can see the change, you can see the difference. And one of the things I like here in this photo, you can see the uh, technology and the technology that we've been able to integrate in our classrooms has been extraordinarily helpful. Um, in terms of what we're looking at here, we are projecting a decrease in special education contracted consultation services. We're looking to uh, save over $56,000 there. Uh, one of the reasons we feel we can save in that area is we are looking to utilize ESSER funding to provide clinical supports for families and students. And we think by providing these clinical supports through ESSER, we can reduce the operating budget for next year. We're also anticipating a reduction in legal services for HR and special education at this point in time. That's a modest decrease. And again, that's one of those that is always the wild card. 
In terms of purchase property service drivers, uh, we're seeing a projected decrease in instructional repairs and maintenance, uh, just because the machines were not used nearly as much as they were uh, last year. And again, um, our current lease obligations with Chromebooks, copiers, and our Transition Academy remain unchanged for 2021-2022. One of the things the Board of Education did this year was we reallocated funding out of this operating budget uh, to procure Chromebooks so that we did not have to push that off to next year. In addition to that, um, we also had our uh, Go Math curriculum program that was ending after a six year license. So the board approved a transfer of funds to be able to purchase a three year commitment to uh, go math out of this year's operating budget. Uh, those materials have been purchased and they are currently at Stillman uh, awaiting transfer out to buildings for next year. Again, some of our other drivers where we're looking to see a decrease next year, we're uh, projecting consolidation and decrease of special education routes uh, for transportation. Uh, we are seeing an increase in new software and licenses to meet the needs of staff and students. I will say with regard to um, licenses and software, um, we are adamant about making sure that we assess whether or not these programs and licenses are being utilized. We are constantly assessing whether or not um, they are in place in classrooms. If they're not being utilized, we're not going to continue to pay for them. So that goes on through our tech team on a yearly basis. And again, we do see an anticipated net decrease in tuition costs with regard to our projected students going to magnets, special ed programs, as well as BOAG programs. Just a couple of other uh, supplies and uh, drivers within supplies. Again, I noted uh, projected decrease in instructional supplies throughout the district. Um, we just have not had the same level of demand because we've had more kids at home. Uh, we're seeing an anticipated decrease of new and replacement textbooks. And again, uh, the fact that we were able to purchase the Go Math materials this year uh, certainly provided us flexibility for next year. And we are expecting an increase in technology supplies related to infrastructure and instruction. Um, you know, one of the things that our tech team always warns us about is making sure our network is strong. Um, we, on average, are hit by about uh, 5,000 threats a day to our network people trying to infiltrate and get in. So we wanna make sure the network is as up to date as possible, is as secure as possible in, and is as safe as possible. I do wanna also make note of the uh, photo here. This is our uh, music team across the district and they are doing a uh, virtual music performance that they provided out to all the students in the district. So. And then again, our final property uh, driver, what we're looking to see here um, in terms of an increase, we're looking at some replacement devices with our staff desktops and some student Chromebooks with regard to those that are coming off lease. Um, and again, as I mentioned, access points and servers. Uh, one of the things we've done at the high school with regard to uh, infrastructure is we are taking the uh, camera system in-house as opposed to having to contract out with an outside vendor. Uh, our IT team is well versed at being able to replace these units and manage the, uh, the DVR. So again, we're doing everything we can to make sure that we are um, as efficient as possible. So as, as I wrap up and get ready to turn it over to questions, I just uh, wanna make sure that I'm uh, making everyone aware of the fact that the district has um, received funding or will receive funding through the ESSER II funds. Uh, those funds include uh, $1,214,993. And then just last week, uh, we learned that we would be receiving funding through the American Rescue Plan Act. So on the municipal side, Weathersfield will receive $2,567,845. And the LEA, the Local Education Agency, Weathersfield Public Schools, will receive $2,632,000. With regard to the ESSER funding, what we're looking at spending that uh, money on over the course of the next couple of years, as I mentioned, is a clinical program to support our learners with mental health support and emotional support. Uh, we're looking to enhance our summer school opportunities, so that will be funded out of ESSER funding as well. With regard to the American Rescue Plan Act, uh, the number is what we received last week. We're still waiting to hear what the parameters will look like and how quick quickly that money will be released. So those are some of our drivers at this point in time. And uh, at this point, I would be uh, very happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Emmett. Uh, I see Mary Pelletier. 
uh, Councilwoman Phelps here. Uh, thanks, and I apologize if there's any background noise. My computer's having issues. Um, I first, I, I wanted to th thank you, Mr. Emmett, for the work you did with um, getting all the teachers and staff vaccinated. Um, I think in you know getting the kids back to school full time, and hopefully they can go back five days um, now that the teaching mm -hmm. teachers and staff have been vaccinated. Um, but I have a question about the um, ESSER funds. Is there anything contained in your budget? that could be offset with the use of I, the ESSER funds. I know the, the American Rescue Plan funds, we don't know the parameters of that yet, but um, it, it is a substantial amount of money. So I was just um, wondering if there's anything else there that could be, that those federal funds could be used to offset. Yeah, I think, uh, thank you for the question. I think that with regard to some of the uh, technology components, that's certainly an area there. Um, you know, one of the things from the state level with regard to the ESSER funding, the ESSER funding priorities are academic supports, learning loss, learning acceleration and recovery, uh, family and community connections. So that's that clinical component we were talking about. The summer school certainly addresses the academic supports, school safety and social emotional well being for the whole student and our school staff, uh, and then remote learning, staff development, and the digital divide. At this point in time, uh, I don't know if remote learning is going to be an option for next year. That has not been decided by the state. It will be for the remainder of this year. So that's certainly something that you know we're still monitoring. Um, as of this afternoon, I looked at the numbers and we had at uh, pre-K through six, we had 85% of our students back in district full-time. We welcomed back uh, grades nine and 10 today. We had 65% of our freshmen and sophomores back. So. You know, we'll certainly be looking for other ways where we can support uh, through ESSER funds, the operating uh, of the school. I would also say too, Ms. Pelletier, that one of the things we did over the course of this year with some of the other funding sources, we had, we had the coronavirus relief funds that was state funding. Um, so what we ended up doing there was we um, pitched in and worked with physical services and we put forward $83,000. Um, of that funding to the town so that we purchase Clorox machines. So we have sanitizing machines at all of our schools, uh, cleaning supplies and filters for HVAC systems. Uh, in addition, we utilized our cafeteria fund. We purchased floor scrubbers for cafeterias at Weatherseal High School, Silas Dean Middle School and Highcrest. Um, and we also purchased convertible benches and uh, slash tables uh, that allowed us to be able to have lunch in the cafeteria and keep kids facing the same direction and uh, keeping them safe. So that total was 105000 So we're certainly looking to work with the town whatever way we can to make sure that we try and maximize the, uh, the efficiency. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I've seen Councilman Hill's hand up as well. You know, I actually had the same question as uh, Councilor Peltier. I'm all set. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Councilman Forrest. Thanks, Mayor. Um, I would like to go to slide 11. And um, on slide 11, it indicated a 2% health increase premium. And um, usually our health increases are somewhere between 8 and 12%. So I don't know if there's an offset here. Or, or what type of insurance are we talking about? Or can you explain how that 2% gathers into more of like health care costs and if that's all of it or was there an offset, et cetera? Matt, can you take that one, please? Member sure. of the insurance committee. Yeah, Mr. Forrest, that was um, in collaboration with Mike O'Neill, the town finance director and in consultation with Chris Monroe from USI, that was the projected premium increase we were instructed to use for 21-22. That's for medical and dental. And is that is that the anticipated, I mean, is that a number that we could anticipate and then also on the town side? Correct. And that, and that when we talk about premium specifically, are we talking about the overall healthcare cost increase or is that sort of a carve out and there's also other aspects of healthcare that we're not- No, that, that's in the aggregate. And I believe the way the town builds their health insurance budget the same way the board does, where we look at, this, on the board side, because we started a little earlier, we look at December um, enrollment in the plan, any employees and what type of coverage they have. 
and then we take the current premium cost and add that percentage to it to get an aggregate cost. And I'm assuming that Mr. O'Neill does the same, but at a later date as your budget process starts uh, in the new year. Is there anything that you attribute to such a decrease? I thought we were at almost 13% last year, and now we're looking at two, which by the way is fantastic news. Mm -hmm. So I'm very interested to mm -hmm. see uh, what, what changed and why. Yeah, and then Chris Monroe had a great analysis that I, I think they were a little conservative going into this fiscal year, anticipating that there would be more um, elective surgeries, operations, that the claims would increase, but it just never materialized. And I believe there is an insurance committee meeting this Thursday, so we can solidify that number and get some more details as well. Okay. Um, changing topic slightly, uh, we have... Uh, ongoing, we have a, a busing, I don't know if situation is the right word, but it tends to be that the buses are not filled uh, or you know, ne anywhere near capacity on their bus routes. Has consideration been given? Uh, and we've had the discussions about, do you need one seat for each child or not? Um, has consideration been given about uh, being more efficient with the use of our busing so that the buses are used and pick up a good load of children to drop off at one time rather than sort of running buses with three or four children in them? Yeah, and it typically, that's a good question. And I think with the pandemic, Matt, what you're seeing is the vast majority of parents are opting not to have their kids go on the bus. And sure. All you have to do is drive by one of the elementary schools in the morning and you see the traffic and uh, you know that, that they are not taking the bus. Um, you know, we continue to work to try and make routes as efficient as possible. Uh, the challenge that you end up getting like at the high school level, you know, I, I could have buses in the fall that are virtually empty because of sports. And then by the winter time, they're you know, full again because the fall sports are over and kids aren't doing winter sports. You know, we'll continue to monitor and, and look if there are ways that we can increase the efficiency of the routes. Um, I'm hopeful that parents, you know, once we get to the point where we're a little bit beyond this pandemic, parents will go back to having their kids you know, riding the bus um, as opposed to driving. But I can tell you when we have to get into the contact tracing, it involves a bus. Uh, you know, we do have kids that have to get quarantined. So parents are trying to avoid that. Yeah, and certainly during the pandemic, you know, we can understand that. Uh, but this has been an issue for years before the pandemic. So I didn't know if there was sort of a critical look at that as we move either out of, but are, are you telling me that um, prior to the pandemic, uh, that there would be occasions when buses were, you know, ge had general good capacity, I don't know what that is, 70% plus, um, and that it really is the differentiation, you know, week or season to season that changes that capacity that, that much. Yeah, I, I think especially at the high school level, not so much at the um, elementary level. I think the elementary level, the, the routes are pretty well set. I'm not finding at the elementary level outside of the pandemic that we're having runs of, you know, four or five kids. And correct me if I'm wrong, Matt. I, I mean, I know you have the bus lists. Yeah, we've, we've seen a significant increase in ridership over the last several weeks. We have many routes that are in the mid-20s, and with the distancing, that's right where we want to be, really. We don't want to exceed that too much. And trying to consolidate routes or tighten up is difficult because we are obligated to provide uh, ride or seating for students throughout the district, depending on the distance from the school, even though they may not elect at the beginning of the year, they can opt in at any time. And the way our tiers are run with the three schools, they are, the timing is tight as it is because we have different elementary start and release times and the middle school and the high school are only about 20 minutes apart. So it is difficult to even consider consolidating two routes into one combined bus. Thank you for that information. Uh, last question uh, relates to the ESSER funds and the, I can't remember what the current name of it is, the America Act, the most recent one. Um, it looks like the town will be receiving significant funding uh, in various ways. I wasn't quite clear on whether or not this budget includes portions of those two funding bills. And then also, what is the technical trail of money? Is that, a, is that money that's given to the town and then we have to pre-allocate that so we can wash it through or is it given directly to the schools in part or in whole? You could help sort of that logistics. So as we are building our budget, we can understand okay, you know, these resources will be there for them if we make these particular cuts so it's not sort of a real cut but a shell game versus something else or the opposite. We're, we're getting money and we, on our side of the books, you know, we're okay and we can understand how the 
taxation has to happen, but but we have to allocate that money, even though we get an offset directly to the town. If you could help explain that logistic. Yeah, thank you, Meg. Uh, good question. I understand that the ESSER funding will come directly to the district um, and the grant application is open now. Um, there is a process that we have to go through, including a needs assessment, and we'll be getting some technical support from the State Department of Education on that needs assessment. So that'll come directly to, uh, to the, uh, the district. With regard to the American Rescue Plan Act, I'm assuming that will come to the district and then the municipal uh, funding will go directly to, uh, to the town. But again, I don't have the parameters on that. Um, I participated in the governor's municipal call last Wednesday and they were trying to nail down exactly when that funding would be made available. And there was thinking that it would be within the next month or so. So um, I'm not clear on that one. And then again, ECS funding uh, at this point in time, Governor Lamont is talking about level funding uh, ECS. Our ECS dollars, um, $10,885,177. And that funding goes directly to the town. So is it my understanding that at least for, it sounds like the ESSER funds and the American funds go, the portion that is for education goes directly to education and not a flow through the town. So we Correct. could say, if we know that there's gonna be allocated, let's say a million dollars to education, we at, and if we under, and if we agreed upon what you know what level of educational services we want to agree, we could remove the million dollars from the town allocation, and and then the feds would come in with the million dollars, and it would it would be funded at that level. Is that the concept that you're thinking of? I'm explaining it, okay? Yeah, I mean the concept that I see, Matt, is being <clears throat> able to utilize these funds to enhance what we have. Not, not to reduce the overall operating budget. Um, you know, one of the things that I tried to do here with the ESSER funding, knowing that it was coming in, I didn't try and pack the budget with a lot of extras. So for example, I mentioned that clinical program. Right. That clinical program is going to, you know, I'm gonna have clinical therapists in contracted clinical therapists because those of you that have been on council for a while, you remember the stimulus uh, funding that came in back in like 08, 09 where we got all of this funding, we hired positions, and then that grant funding dried up. And then what ended up happening? We had to absorb those positions into our operating budget. So we're trying to be strategic about that. And the piece with regard to the administrative, I, I need to make sure that those administrative positions would fit within the realm of ESSER funding um, and make sure that we can provide that uh, level of service within the funds, so. So cur currently though, those with the budget that you just, just presented, including those two, administrative positions, that's not intended to be paid at this moment through ESSER funds though. That's- That is correct. The town is looking to, to, to fund that. That is correct. And yep. then is it your anticipation that if those ESSER funds came in or the American funds came in, do you sort of have a list of, uh, you're like, hey, we're, we're keeping this pretty tight right now, but we have a list of things that we wanna do. And is the idea, because we should know this, we're talking about some decent money here, is the idea that we're gonna now use those funds for a laundry list of items on the Board of Education that we're not necessarily seeing here. Yeah, I think that's safe to say at this point in time, especially with the American Rescue Plan Act. I mean, I don't know at this juncture what the parameters are with which we can spend that. So we may have limitations on that. And I think even with the ESSER funding, you know, they talked about those, those four uh, processes that we have to go through in terms of making sure that the funding works. I mean, I'm not going to utilize ESSER funds to you know, pay for raises. What I'd like to be able to use ESSER funds for is to support our kids, to provide right. additional supports, whether it be SRBI supports, additional tutors. Um, I've already talked about the importance of the additional summer school. We always run our extended school year program for our students with special needs, but we're drastically expanding the opportunities so that I can help get kids caught up. At the high school level, that may be um, credit recovery. Uh, and I've got kids that have been out for the better part of a year. I've got families that are disengaged. So that clinical component is gonna be important. The other thing also, I think that's important that the ESSER funds will uh, look to provide is professional development support to help enhance the uh, skill sets of our staff, our, our um, social workers, our psychologists, our classroom teachers. We've been out for a while. And I'd like to be able to also expound upon the equity piece. You know, that's one of the things that we've been working on over the course of the past year. We've got a lot of work. And I know we've got many of our schools that are engaged with equity teams um, and, and engagement teams to make sure we've got families back. But 
I look at the ESSER funding as additional support and not you know, all in one year because we're gonna be here again next year. So I wanna be strategic about this money. We have until 2023 to spend it out. I don't wanna put it all in one basket. And that's true with the American funds too. That's the theory that we're using these two set of funds to in, increase the, the educational system and, and, the, and, the, and what they provide rather mm -hmm. than if the money comes in, we can use as a town council, we can use that as an offset. That's not what you're saying. Is that correct? That's I, Matthew, with regard to the uh, American Rescue Plan, I, that I'm not sure. I'm waiting to get clarification on that. And uh, Mr. Carey, is that your understanding as well, that when these funds come in, it, it shouldn't be used to offset, that it's your guidance, that it be used to increase the amount of services the educational system provides? Correct. That's my understanding. And you... In, you would have to appropriate a budget number anyways, and then we would decide if we want to offset it with the ESSER funds or not. That wouldn't be your choice. Well, we, we certainly could say uh, if, if, the if we know that the funding is coming in, we could anticipate that the educational system is, and then we can make an allocation with that anticipation. I'm not saying we want to, but we could. And then we would know that that, but it's your, your guidance for the Board of Education and the services is that this is your proposed budget and that those funds would be used in addition to, is that my understanding, correct? Correct, supplement, not supplant. Right, okay, thank you. Any other questions from the council? Uh, Councilman O'Connor. Thank you, Mike. Mine's actually, it's off uh, subject in regards to the budget. First, thank you. Uh, Chuck and Mr. Emmett for your efforts on this. I know this is a painstaking task. It's an annual task and it's uh, a very difficult and time consuming task. So I do wanna let you know, I appreciate your efforts on behalf of the town for doing that. Um, I did have a question though, Mr. Emmett, you made a comment and it just kind of caught me off guard. You had stated something about there are 5,000 threats a day that were thwarted. Was that correct, 5,000 a day? Yes, in terms of hacking, absolutely correct. Yes, our firewall system, yep. Our firewall system, it, it, municipalities and school districts are a prime target for hackers. Um, and I know that we had a district out in the central part of the state, out toward Waterbury, that actually uh, their system was compromised and it was completely hijacked and shut down. And we have a lot of systems that we run. We're, we're very reliant upon our computer system. So we have a, a network firewall that is constantly monitored by our IT team. And yeah, we face on average 5,000 threats a day. Wow, I just I was just flabbergasted by that number, but I guess that's pretty common. Yes, unfortunately it is. Wow. All right, no, that was just that I just caught me off guard on that, but thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else with any questions? Um, just refresh my memory from uh, last summer. Did was there? <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, summer school offered to students last summer. We offered a an extended school year program. We did it virtually for our students with special needs, and then we did an enrichment program that was virtual. Um, that we did not think would be very popular because of the fact it was all virtual and having been virtual from March through June, we didn't think there'd be a lot of interest. There was a huge amount of interest, so much so that we had to bring in extra teaching staff to cover that. It was a short-term uh, program, just an enrichment program. This year's program will be a little bit more targeted toward uh, student needs and closing gaps. And can any of the ESSER funds or the American Rescue Plan funds, when, when they come in, can that cover all the cost of summer school? Yes, it should be able to, Mike, at this point in time. Uh, and that's one of the things that we were shifting that uh, funding over to ESSER. Um, you know, again, I mentioned that the um, ESSER funding is designed for academic supports, learning loss, learning acceleration and recovery. So. I certainly think summer school is a viable um, expenditure under ESSER two. And you know, one of the things that we have to be careful of, I know we're gonna have a lot of strong um, interest among students. I do have to make sure that uh, our staffing levels are such that we can support it. So 
we're doing the work right now to make sure that we have coordinators in place um, at the middle, high, and elementary levels for that particular program. Okay. And then um, I know you probably don't have it off the top of your head, but on average in the schools, how many counselors are in the schools? Uh, like guidance counselors? Guidance counselors or um, any, oh. you know, Sports staff for um, you know kids that are um, you know falling behind, learning wise. Yeah, in terms of support staff, I have social work support at this time in all of my buildings, with the exception of Silas Dean. Silas Dean's only part time. I have two guidance counselors at the middle school. I believe I have seven guidance counselors at the high school. Um, I. <laughs> would say that I'm short staffed in terms of special ed support. I could certainly use additional special ed teachers. And again, that may be something that we look at the ESSER funding or the uh, um, additional funds we have coming from the government at this point in time. Um, I think that uh, in terms of psychologists, I have a psychologist for each building. I do have one additional psychologist that does evaluations and splits their time between Silas Dean and the high school. So. Um, I will say over the course of time, since I came aboard in uh, 2008, uh, we did not have, when I came in, uh, we did not have social workers in each building. They had to split. And it was extraordinarily inefficient, especially when we had students dealing with crisis situations and the social worker wasn't there. So we've definitely increased the amount of uh, support. And actually I would argue that we probably utilize the stimulus funds to uh, increase the number of social workers in the district. So. But again, you had to, they were kind of, for lack of a better term, baked in with the uh, um, stimulus funds. And then, Correct. okay. Correct. And just in thank you to all the other counselors and, and to Matt um, and to uh, uh, you, Mr. Emmett, for answering a lot of the questions that I had already uh, written down. Um, one thing that I always ask is attrition. Is there, um, how are we looking with attrition in the um, school, all schools? Yeah, I, we didn't see as many retirements as I thought we would see. Uh, I know we have one at the special ed ranks. Uh, I think we have one other classroom and I have one at the middle school at this point in time that I think are built in. In addition to that, I will have a, a teacher coming back in uh, that was on an unpaid sabbatical leave over the past year. So that will cover one of those particular positions. So not as many as I anticipated. And usually we get to see some additional retirements by the time the budget process is over, if I'm not mistaken. We usually see a couple more. Yeah, and it, they tend to be, uh, that's a good question. The positions that uh, end up coming open through attrition tend to be the paraeducator positions. Once we get beyond the scope of the school year, typically what happens when we have a teacher who's retiring, um, you know, we'll know in advance. Obviously this year, you know, we had an administrator that's retiring. Mr. Moore will be leaving us. He donned the Eagle costume today for uh, welcoming back the uh, freshman and sophomore. He'll be leaving us at the end of uh, this month. And uh, Siobhan O'Connor, our current principal at Highcrest, will be assuming the uh, role of principal at the high school. So we've posted the position for Highcrest and that's one that we're working on filling now. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for uh, Mr. Emmett or the team from uh, the board? Thank you. I, I will just echo, echo the uh, sentiments that uh, Mary started off with. Um, thank you so much for all that you have done, not only, you know, just this school year, but, you know, starting basically to this time last year um, in, um, you know, not only uh, working through the struggles of uh, the beginning of the pandemic, but, um, you know, getting kids prepared for summer, as you said, and then for, um, you know, the, the slow gradual reopening of the schools. Uh, I think you did an excellent job uh, and kudos to the administration, the board, as well as all the staff for keeping the kids safe, but uh, also keeping the teachers safe uh, throughout this time. Um, it was great to hear all the good news from last uh, Friday and Sunday, I believe, uh, with the, uh, the COVID vaccination rollout. With that said, 
uh, for the teachers? Do you have a, a, a guess or a, an idea what percentage of the teachers and administration have, uh, have been fully vaccinated for COVID? At this point in time, uh, Mayor Rell, I don't have a specific percentage. Um, I've still got teachers that are going out. Um, we tried a dual approach. So we worked with the VAM system. So on March 1st, they were uploaded into the VAM system. Um, I had consulted with the Central Connecticut Health District and we were looking at doing a clinic at Weathersfield High School. The CCHD didn't have the capacity to do it. Um, I had the nursing staff to be able to do it, but our nurses did not have the requisite certification. So the CCHD could not allocate the vaccines to us. So we engaged in a partnership with Hartford Healthcare um, to be able to provide the opportunity for all of our staff uh, to be vaccinated. And you know, one of the things the state asked superintendents to do was to reach out to our private and parochial facilities as well as our licensed daycares. So I was very uh, proud to have been able to do that. So our friends at Corpus Christi were able to participate in the vaccine clinic as well as our local uh, preschool programs and all of our licensed daycares um, that uh, were interested in getting that vaccine. So with regard to um, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which was the clinic that occurred uh, on the 5th and the 7th, that was a one dose Johnson & Johnson. I do know that there were also staff members who um, opted to go for the either the Pfizer or the, or the Moderna. Um, Hartford Healthcare offered another clinic this past weekend at 1290 Silas Dean. I know I had some staff members that attended that. That was the Pfizer. Um, I do expect that by the end of the month, the vast majority of the staff members who requested uh, vaccines will, uh, in fact, have been vaccinated. So um, the other thing to make sure we're aware of with regard to uh, immunity, uh, we look at 14 days beyond the last shot. So for the Johnson & Johnson, all the staff members that got it, we're looking at the immunity taking place either this Friday or at the latest next Monday. And with that, um, our staff members that have had that vaccine will no longer have to quarantine, which is a huge load <laughs> off from our, us with regard to finding subs. So Absolutely. we're getting yeah. close. We're getting close. But I will say, as I said in my communication today, we had a robust number of cases over the course of the uh, weekend. So this is not behind us yet. Uh, we lost our boys basketball team, both varsity and junior varsity um, with quarantines and positive cases and a wrestling team that was doing training has also been shut down for the remainder of the uh, winter season. So it's still out there folks. Yes. Okay. Hearing no more questions, I think we're good. Uh, thank you. We will definitely be working uh, like we did last year um, with you guys uh, on this. And, um, you know, hopefully it will go uh, as smooth as last year's went. Um, Chuck, uh, we do appreciate the invitations to the um, workshops as well. That was very useful. Um, I've always taken advantage of those whenever I could get there just to get a sense of what um, you guys are or how, how you guys are framing your, your budget and uh, it's very insightful. So we do appreciate the open communication and, and definitely the transparency that was uh, um, uh, given for us. Um, real quick, and it may not even be real quick, uh, Mr. Emmett, we are going to be discussing uh, later on, uh, I believe we're going to open the agenda to take up um, a request of the uh, Board of Ed for the phase three study for the um, school renovation and rebuild. Um, I don't want to keep you for the entire duration of our council meeting. So, um, you know, if, if the floor is open to you if you can explain um, a little bit about that phase three study. Um, it would probably help us um, with our uh, vote later on. Sure, yeah, that'd be my pleasure. So uh, with regard to phase three, um, those of you who have been on council for a while know that we have engaged in a uh, long range uh, building project plan for our elementary schools. Uh, I don't think I'm the first one to tell you that our elementary schools are tired. Uh, they range anywhere from being built in 1962 uh, up to I think the newest one is about 1971. Um, and they are tired. 
And one of the things we looked at doing was engaging with uh, a consultant to study the feasibility of a long range building plan. And this was twofold. So when we went out to bid, we were looking for a facilities assessment of our buildings, as well as a long-term 10-year enrollment projection so that we knew what we were looking at down the road. We didn't want to plan to build too big. And we wanted to see if there were ways that we could become more efficient with the number of buildings we have. So we engaged, we went out through the bidding process. Um, Colliers International ended up winning the bid and Colliers came in and provided us with a very comprehensive assessment of our facilities. So um, rough and tough, they looked at repairs across all five elementary schools to the tune of $31.7 million. Uh, that includes uh, HVAC systems at each building. It includes exterior shells such as roofs. Uh, you might've seen in uh, capital improvement this year, I know roof replacement at Highcrest was on the list. Um, the HVAC systems, we dealt with, you know, ventilation issues we were concerned about at the beginning of the year, with the exception of Hanmer boiler going down. Um, we were okay over the course of the winter. Uh, I would mention also that the Hanmer boilers are older than me. They date back to the beginning, uh, 1966. The build, that building opened in 1967. So we are running on the original 55 year old boilers. Um, we had a leak this year and we were very fortunate to be able to have gotten that one fixed. So with regard to the, uh, the process in phase two, what we looked at was we honed in on the um, enrollment study and that study is available on our website. I know I've shared it in the past. Uh, Weathersfield is really remarkably stable and the projection out over the course of the next 10 years was to maintain that level of stability. As a town, we're largely built out, so we're not going to be looking at a lot of um, extensive housing development. Um, so we're not going to see an increase there, but the housing stock is remarkably stable. And I think you've seen recently um, with the pandemic, the housing market here in Wethersfield and in the greater Hartford area has been uh, rather robust. Um, so we're seeing stable numbers and we project those numbers out um, over the course of the next now seven years. With regard to phase two, the focus there was really doing the due diligence and um, developing plans. So what they did was Colliers went through and looked at various site plans and we looked at various scenarios. And what we're looking to do is to build new for two buildings, renovate as new two buildings and ultimately take one offline. And within the scope of doing this, we would end up being able to redistrict and going from five buildings to four become a little more efficient in the physical services department down the road. So um, in terms of building new, we'd be looking at building new Highcrest, building new Hanmer, renovate as new Emerson Williams, renovate as new uh, Webb. And then ultimately uh, at the end of the decade, uh, taking Charles Wright offline. We did plot placements of each building uh, that was done during phase two. And um, the physical space for Charles Wright is extraordinarily difficult. And again, if you've been over there at drop off or pickup time, we have too many curb cuts as it is and we have no discernible space to get in there. Now with that being said, um, how quickly we do these, do we do two build new and then two renovate is new? We don't know, that's what we need to finish up in phase three. I think the other thing that's important to understand too with phase three is really doing some of the, the base geotechnical stuff, wanting to make sure that we um, update the enrollment study. We do the geotech and we look at these plots and make sure that what we are proposing to do is something we can actually do. And then finally, the conclusion of phase three, it gets us ready to go for referendum. And again, folks, at this point in time, we have not yet made the decision as to whether or not we'll do one referendum for all buildings or we would do multiple referendums over the course of time. And then finally, last but not least, we would look to do swing space. Um, again, we learned our lesson with regard to the high school, way over budget, ultimately, with all the hazmat, and it took a lot longer to get finished. And uh, this way, we would utilize an existing building as swing space. So when I take other buildings offline, such as Emerson, Williams, and Webb, those kids are completely out of the space. It's much more efficient. It's much more uh, uh, time, time efficient and it's less costly. So 
that's where we're at. So we're looking for funding uh, to the tune of 60,800. And this will uh, allow us to provide uh, an updated enrollment projection. We'll also focus on the development of educational specifications for our buildings. We'll talk about um, our uh, process of geotech engineering and looking at uh, some of our work that we need to do with the State Department of Education and the State uh, Department of Administrative Services and looking at uh, storm water monitoring as well. And then ultimately coming forward to the public with a complete plan. And I am hopeful being able to go to the state uh, following a referendum with a very clearly articulated plan for a long range uh, building project for all of our elementary schools. So. Do you know um, what the reimburse reimbursement rate from the state is for uh, new construction versus, and I guess new construction and uh, rebuild as new? Renovate is new. The last number I had was 57%. And I want to say that the reimbursement for a new build was in the upper 40s. I can get that for you. Let me get the specifics on that one, Mayor Ralph. Okay. Renovate is new is definitely 57%. I recall that from our days at the high school. And those haven't changed in 10 years? Uh, those have not changed recently at this point in time, no. Okay. Does anybody have any questions for Mr. Emmett, uh, Deputy Mayor? Yeah, a couple things, uh, Mr. Emmett. Uh, yes, sir. Was the phase three uh, portion of the uh, a study in the competitive bid? No, it was not. Bid? It was not. So will you be going out for bid for this or? No, sir, it? not not for this. This would be with the same contractor that we worked with, with uh, both phase one and phase two. Okay. And then also in their study, did Collier's uh, shed any light on the $31.7 million worth of work. And I understand this project could, could be like a 10 year program or something, you know, yes. very lengthy. Um, how much of that $31.7 million are we going to have to spend just to keep the buildings operational? I mean, like, we're, like you said, we're gonna be fixing some roofs on uh, Highcrest uh, this coming year and, and so forth. So. We may end up, you know, replacing boilers and such, and only to eventually knock that building down. So, do they yeah, give you a how that would work out? Yeah, that's. I mean, you bring up a very valid point, and you know, you get to that point where our infrastructure has gone as far as it can go, and then you have to replace. Let me give you an example with Highcrest, and you know why I think that the roof replacement at Highcrest makes sense. We would look at Highcrest as being the swing space for the two build as new. So even after Highcrest was built new, you know, near that the current site, we'd be utilizing that building for, for many years beyond. So that I see as being feasible. Um, I think the other piece too, let's take for example, rebuilding the portables over at Charles Wright. We don't see Charles Wright going offline for the next decade. I don't think that those portables are going to last that amount of time. So, um, you know, the only other one that's I was hoping to be able to get to, you know, get hammer rebuilt prior to having to do the boilers. But from what I understand from Sally Katz, those boilers are really they've long gone beyond their useful life. So I'd certainly like to make sure that we develop our planning that eliminates or at least limits uh, Deputy Mayor Mazzarella some of the you know, potential costs that we would end up not getting our bang for the buck on. And then just the uh, last uh, question, uh, moving forward, when would you start this study, uh, assuming we approve this tonight? I am ready to go with regard to the geotechnical work uh, and our enrollment study consultant is ready to go as well. The only uh, piece that's gonna take a little more time is the process of the uh, development of educational specifications. But again, right now we're, we're not trying to push things and get in a application to the state um, by June of 2021. We're talking about getting an application to the state by June of 2022. 
which gives us ample time to be able to plan. I have talked with both uh, Representative Wood as well as Representative Morin Bellow and provided them with an update on this plan. They're both supportive of it and felt that uh, application out uh, June of 22 would be something that they could fully support. Thanks. Thank you. I'm just looking around. Any other questions for Mr. Emmett on this? Okay. Well, thank you uh, again. Um, appreciate the update on the uh, budget and the uh, um, status of the schools uh, as we are preparing for a full opening in the next couple of weeks, I would presume. Yes. And then, um, you know, some discussion further on. Uh, the uh, renovate as new and rebuild. So um, appreciate that. Thank you, sir. Thank you guys. Have a great night. Have a good Thank evening. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Take care. And then we are in the agenda for, for tonight. We do not have any hearings under public uh, A1 public comment. Um, we do, I believe, have some people on the line for general comments. So we'll move to public comment A2, A, for uh, comments from those who have called in. And then let me just uh, repeat, uh, we've had some issues in the past. I just want to make sure uh, folks who call in there are two uh, opportunities to talk. Uh, we, we do limit both to five minutes each, so a total of 10 minutes. Uh, we allow some latitude to go over and, and wrap up uh, your, uh, your testimony, but uh, please um, be mindful of if you hear the, the buzzer go off, we'll, we'll try and update you as, as you get close to the uh, five minute mark. Um, and of course, uh, as we are dealing with uh, this being virtually, we are um, broadcast not only on TV, but on YouTube. We um, please be cordial in your comments and uh, be um, mindful that uh, uh, what you say is on the public record. So thank you. With that, Mr. Evans. Okay, the first caller is 860-563-6923. Please state your name and address for the record, press star six to unmute yourself. Uh, good evening, Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. Uh, as you know, I've been talking to you folks about what we could possibly do with the Keisha Farm. And uh, what I did tonight was I sent each of, each of you, uh, the town manager, the council members, and the town clerk, each uh, an email that had a, uh, a Word document on it with a, with a number of uh, attachments. And uh, of those attachments, those are properties that are local, that are in 55 plus communities here in our area. And that's what I propose we should do with the Keisha Farm. We should not look at it as a property that we're going to sink money into and forever and ever, but to, but to do something with it that will turn into revenue for the town forever and ever. And what I did was I, you know, that first uh, link that I, 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 I provided everybody was, was a 55-plus was a, um, uh, a building. That's, that was for sale some time ago. It sold for uh, four hundred and fifty four hundred and five thousand dollars and it was located at number 14 Deming Road in Newington, only less than three miles from the Keisha Farm, west of the Berlin Turnpike. Um, this particular property, uh, like I say, it, it was four hundred and five thousand dollars that it sold for. It was a twenty five hundred square foot house. Um, they had a condo fee, or if that's what you want to call it, a monthly fee, which means uh, of $225, which means that the, the town doesn't have to take care of the roads. It's taken care of by the residents. Um, 
And of course, if the residents are 55 and over, there, are, there should not be any children coming out to uh, uh, utilize our, our school system. Would we require garbage? Maybe, I don't know. But the fact is this particular property is paying $10,943 a year in property tax. Uh, the next property I have is uh, number 27 Deming Road. Um, that, that, that was priced at $359,000. It had still this $225 monthly fee, and, it, and its taxes were $9,631. Um, of that, uh, again, it, it's the same idea where the, 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 the citizen who owns that house is taking care of the road. Uh, through their monthly fees. Over in Rocky Hill, uh, less, approximately three miles from the Keisha farm, there's uh, number 16 Bri uh, Fox Briar Lane. And, and that's sold for $425,000. And uh, their condo fee or monthly fee was $275. You know, th th this is nice fees that are being paid to take care of the services that the town would have provided. And, and, and in Rocky Hill, which has lower taxes, evidently, this more expensive house uh, has a tax bill of $8,886 uh, for this current year. But by the time you start building these places on the Keisha farm, they would probably be up in the $10,000 range for, all, for each of them or close to it or even more. I don't know what it would be. Uh, the number four, uh, and the fourth one that I also provided you with was on Old Mill Old Mill uh, Windmill Crossing, again, in Rocky Hill. And this is across the street from the Gilbert Farm. Uh, and, and again, it's only about three miles from the Keisha Farm. And, and that, is, that is priced at the $385,000 range. It was last sold in 2018 with a tax bill of $8,980. If that house was in Weathersfield, it would probably be 10000 or more. Uh, and then the fifth one uh, it was old, uh, another one on Old Windmill Crossing, and, and that price was $395,000 each uh, for, for that one. And their tax bill was $7,953, and uh, that, I think that was based on 2015-2016 tax. So what, what I'm trying to say to you folks is that uh, we could put on that property probably – a hundred units of these types of homes. I would say if you gave it more open space, you probably would end up giving it a, a yielding probably 80 or 85 homes. And if you were getting a theoretical $10,000 a piece, you were looking at 800,000 plus for additional revenue. And what I would suggest is we would get rid of our, our, our bond that we have that we're going to pay for the next 20 years and bringing it, bring in a, a reputable builder who would buy each lot from the town of Wethersfield as he, bought, as he sold his house. That Mr. means he Young, doesn't own the property. Yes, I understand. The, I'll wrap it up. Yep, yep, but I really the, think our, that we should be looking at revenue such as this instead of putting money, putting something there that's going to cost us forever and ever. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't see your, um, your clock come up. Oh, yeah, that's right. We did have a clock last time. Is it not showing on your screen? It's now on the screen, but it's too low. It's too I had, low. It, I had it over. I had it to the side. So there you go. Now, now you're okay. Now you're okay. I can see it. I, ha I had it over to the side. All right. Well, I'll take a look and try to make it more apparent. On my screen, it was showing, so I couldn't tell. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Of course, now I lost it. Next caller is eight six zero six nine zero. 0855. Hello, Katie Sullivan, 79 Wright Road. Um, I'm calling because I understand that there is a possibility for the town to speak to 
the decommissioning of Brainerd Airport. And I wanted to speak as not a resident of Old Weathersfield, although I know they uh, suffer with planes going o over all the time. But I am the manager of the Web Barn in Old Weathersfield. And I just wanted to speak to the fact that um, planes flying overhead are definitely a nuisance to people that are getting married on the grounds at the barn. I also think um, I am pretty much know for sure that I lost at least one possible booking because the bride loved it and then planes started flying overhead and the mother put her foot down and said absolutely not. So I think um, you know for the people of Old Weathersfield that live there, for the businesses there, I, I just would like to see the town support the idea of decommissioning Brainerd Field. And that's all I had to say. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan. Okay, the next caller is 860-808-9968. Remember you have to press star six to unmute yourself. And that number again, 860-808-9968. Star six to unmute. That's what I did. Oh, there we go. You're on now. You're on. Um, we can get, oh. I can, yes. We can hear you. All right, great. This is Tim Woodworth, uh, 33 Mill Street, 5H. Uh, I first want to give a shout out to Peter Gillespie for. Uh, can, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Let me get it. You might need to turn down the TV or computer. Oh, behind. right, right. Right. Okay. Sorry about that. Does that work? I hope. And is this Anyway, yeah. Bob, um, so I'd like to give a shout out to Peter Gillespie for setting up the heritage walk signs in our historic walkable village and for seeking the Connecticut Humanities uh, uh, grant to extend that, especially uh, in <clears throat> number one, the uh, infographic from the classic infographic coming from Phil Lohman. Uh, map of the uh, village, but also uh, the Great Meadows Conservation Trust. And we're excited to have the Heritage Walk extended across Route 3 to uh, Middletown Avenue and uh, to <clears throat> offer uh, a little more in-depth history of both the uh, Native American, early American, and uh, modern history and natural history of the Great Me of the uh, Wood Parcel. Um, and uh, look forward to that happening. A lot of people have sought out this parcel in COVID-19 time, times, and we will have another little kids walk in the spring. Anyhow, um, I also wanted to, to say that uh, we had, Great Meadows Trust had been reached out, uh, it reached out to by the uh, airport to cut some trees on our uh, property in in east uh, on the east of the river in Weathersfield, east of the river, as has Goodwin College on their part. And uh, I don't know if that project is going to go forward, but I do know that they want to cut clear cut from the Weathersfield border north along the river between the dike and the river all the way up to the uh, um, Eversource plant. And uh, I hope that we can head them off. I would love to see some mitigation in the form of cutting down the trees and, and planting uh, pollinator uh, shrubs and make it a shrubland habitat that wouldn't interfere with the, the airline and so forth. And if those, uh, the plans or the possibility of, of closing the airport happen, I'd love to see some kind of uh, green neighborhood developed in, in the South Meadows 
that uh, would have community gardens and rain gardens and pollinator gardens and rooftop gardens on housing that might be on stilts to protect from some um, Katrina-like catastrophe, uh, but also elevate the, the housing units so that they look across over the dike and, of course, have the dike maintained by uh, a Netherlandic style by sheep. It would be a wonderful uh, transformation of the meadows, uh, thanks, I guess, to the fact that the airport has been there all these years. And if that's a one minute, two minutes over, I apologize. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, and, and just for the record, Bob, if you could state your name and Jim. Um, address again, I think we it was a little uh, garbled in the beginning. Right, Jim Woodworth, 33 okay. Mill Street, 58. 5H. Thanks, Jim. All right. Thanks, Gary. Bye-bye. And then, okay. Next caller, 860-563-3387. And again, we got to remind folks, if you would like to speak, you have to hit star six to unmute yourself. Hi, um, my name is Judith Keene, um, 126 Broad Street in Wethersfield. I'd also like to address the issue of the airport being decommissioned. Again, we got to remind folks, if you would like to speak, you have to hit star six. Oh, and Judy, if you can... Um, Turn down the volume either on I the TV or your computer. I did. I just muted it. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you hear me now? We sure can. Okay, good. Um, I'd like to also address uh, the possibility of the decommissioning of Brainerd Airport. Um, I ha I'm delighted, by the way, that there's even a possibility. I've served on the Airport Noise Advisory Commission for years, calling in noisy and intrusive planes flying over. And uh, these are planes where the pilots are advised to go along the river um, to enter the airport space, but they don't. They use the green as their guidance for the most part. Uh, most of my property is behind my house, so and it's a big field. So um, that's like free reign for pilots. They just like to use that as their approach. Um, uh, none of the suggestions, the pleas, or the complaints that we voiced to the airport have actually made any difference at all. Um, but the final straw is that they wanted to cut down um, 30 acres of trees. Um, these trees are, provide beautification to Weathersfield. Um, they prevent erosion, as Jim uh, Woodworth was mentioning, and they are an air, air filter. Um, they take in carbon dioxide and give us oxygen. Um, the, I believe that this plan um, uh, of cutting down the trees was really more for um, in extending the runway and allowing for bigger jets. And there are jets that come through there um, every day. So um, I'm in favor of uh, the town council working with our legislators and the state level to find this uh, option as feasible. I do believe it's a um, nonpartisan issue. Everybody in Weathersfield should be interested in um, maintaining our tree line um, up the river. And, uh, you know, if Hartford can use that area for redevelopment, it could be absolutely beautiful. It could be green space. It could be um, apartments, condos, whatever, on the river, which now is inaccessible to um, all of Hartford. So thank you very much. Thank you, Judy. And I believe that is the last, last caller on that I have on my list here, Mayor. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll turn it over to council reports from the council. Councillor Hill. 
thank you, Mayor. Uh, on March 2nd, I attended the uh, library board um, meeting. Um, they made a few announcements. They, they said that there'd be no in-person meetings or programs until the fall, which is really not unexpected at this time. Uh, they did say that the virtual programming, though, it, while it continues now, they will look to, some of these virtual programs will remain uh, virtual just uh, uh, post pandemic, just due to the popularity of some of them. Um, and then most importantly, we went through the budget line by line. Uh, Brooke Berry and her board, they do a great job of, of stretching a dollar every year. Um, they are gonna be pr proposing to the town a 0.83% increase and that's um, due to personnel and, and health insurance uh, cost drivers. And that's it from the board. Thank you. Any other council reports at all? Okay, hearing none, I will go on to uh, council comments. Anyone with any council comments? Uh, Councilman Hill. Thanks again, Mayor. Um, just just uh, uh, the number of uh, emails that we've gotten as counselors, as well as some of the uh, callers in regarding Brainerd. I do think it's something that we should uh, begin to have a conversation with not only our state delegation up in Hartford, but also maybe some of our uh, neighboring towns such as Hartford, uh, Glastonbury, East Hartford, that all have um, that all have to deal with, with Brainerd. Um, again, this is not a, a uh, decision we want to make unilaterally and we want to understand I think uh, the, the benefits um, to both keeping Brainerd as well as decommissioning it um, as a resident of Old Weathersfield. Um, what uh, Mrs. Keene had just uh, described to us is, is not uncommon. Uh, it is quite a nuisance and does um, affect our quality of life here. But again, this is it's a regional uh, it's a regional issue and I think we should begin to have those conversations with Hartford, Glastonbury, East Hartford uh, and all stakeholders and bring them up to the table and see if we can find a common path forward. Thanks Mayor. Thank you. Any other council comments? And to that, I believe Sue, you had received some correspondence to the uh, council email if we could have that um, at the, uh, the uh, second portion of the public comment, um, would you be able to give a, a synopsis of those uh, comments that have come in? Sure. Okay, thank you. Anybody else with any council comments at all? Okay, I don't wanna steal any of uh, uh, our town manager's uh, thunder, but I do have just some notes that I've taken from um, last meeting as well as uh, where we are um, right now. Uh, tomorrow night, the Social Justice Coalition will be meeting. Um, there is a link to register online. It's on the town website. I believe it's still on the, the top of the, the page. If not, it's on easily accessible to our homepage. They are meeting virtually tomorrow night at 530. Um, we've had a robust uh, group. Who've, uh, who've logged in every uh, previous uh, meeting and uh, the dialogue and the conversations are continuing. And uh, I look forward to, uh, to continuing those conversations. Um, this is a group that uh, has been tasked with uh, uh, working with our town residents as well as with uh, town staff. And uh, we look forward to, uh, to continuing those conversations going forward. Um, with respect to last council meeting, uh, we were all, I think everybody here was on for the DEP presentation on um, you know, uh, town waste as well as you know, garbage disposal. There were some comments that uh, um, had been posted afterwards, uh, you know, just to set the record straight, this council is not you know, taking a, a certain position or, or taking a stand with anything. Um, that was really just an opportunity to listen to some other uh, options that are out there, um, not only from DEEP, but we are continuing conversations with uh, our uh, trash hauling um, contractor on how we can best uh, save residents uh, money, uh, taxpayer dollars with uh, 
reducing the uh, amount of garbage that we put into either landfills or to the current um, trash to energy facility Mira up at the South Meadows. Uh, that facility, if I'm not mistaken, is slated to close uh, just about 15 months from now, July of 2022. So we are, uh, like I said, exploring options out there on how to handle our waste. Um, at the same time, you know, it's probably a good opportunity to discuss um, ways to save uh, taxpayer money in so doing. Um, there are ideas that uh, um, anaerobic digestion with uh, food scraps being thrown out separately, uh, maybe starting with our schools as well as um, organics. A lot of people uh, simply throw their garbage out in or their yard waste out in their garbage, which in turn increases our tipping fees to um, uh, the trash haulers. If there is a way to save uh, taxpayer money by you know re reducing that amount, um, we're all you know open ears for that. Um, again, it's it's these are all preliminary conversations. Nothing is set in stone. It's just a way to look at how we can better manage our um, garbage that we uh, send out of our town and how best we can save uh, residents in having to pay the fees to do that. Um, going a little bit forward and, and again, you know, I, I read the news stories and saw the town manager's uh, report over the last couple months. I am happy to report that for the first time since about November, uh, we've moved the needle uh, somewhat to um, uh, lessen the amount of cases, uh, positive cases over a two week period here in town. Um, we had been since November in the red zone, which means that it's greater than 15 positive cases per 100,000. We are now down to um, just a little over 11, which has moved us down into the orange level. Um, if you guys remember when the state came out with those uh, metrics and um, categories, we had, as well as the you know, majority of the state at the time in the fall, we're in the yellow. Uh, slowly creeped up to orange and into red. Majority of the state has been in red. Uh, we are fortunate with the mitigation strategies and vaccinations to move into orange. And in so doing, um, you know, I, I think we can continue our efforts and uh, get us into the yellow phase. We're hoping in the next two weeks um, when we get some, you know, rolling averages, uh, you know, computed into uh, to the system. Um, that being said, we are also looking going forward into the spring, and uh, I know Peter Gillespie is on the call with us tonight, and he has done a, a yeoman's job of working with local businesses to prepare not only last year, but again this year on the, the reopening now that we're you know looking at spring season. So we're looking at um, outdoor dining at a lot of facilities. We still have the governor's executive order in place that allows and permits for outdoor dining. Um, not only are restaurants looking at this, but I believe I've heard from a couple businesses that are also looking to be able to um, be outside to be able to either sell their wares or um, you know, service the public. Uh, that is great. If we can continue to do that, we can continue to keep the businesses open. And, uh, and um, many of those that have been you know, um, suffering because of uh, economic loss over the last 12 months can begin to, uh, to reopen themselves. Um, and finally, um, Parks and Rec are preparing for spring sports as well. You can um, visit the uh, town website under departments and then into Parks and Rec and get the Parks and Rec brochure. Uh, we are working with the state on uh, reopening guidelines, sector rules, uh, what is limited and what can be um, opened up fully. We're hoping for a, a better spring season than last year and a better, definitely a better um, spring season than last year. But, and, but more importantly, a, a summer of activities for not only our town youth with youth camps, but more importantly for uh, our seniors and our residents to uh, um, be able to get out and uh, enjoy what Weathersfield has to offer. So thank you. And I'll turn it over to Mr. Evans for a town manager report. Thank you, Mayor, and to the council. 
Um, as the mayor mentioned, we do seem to be trending in a positive direction with last year's stats, uh, last year, last week's stats putting us at an orange level where we hit uh, just slightly over 11%, 11 cases per 100,000 residents, uh, which is a significant drop from the week before and even greater from the week before that. Um, so as such, and as the mayor mentioned, I'm currently working with staff in the Central Connecticut Health District to review, call it a town-wide reopening of our facilities as well as programming options. Um, while I don't have a date set or a date necessarily in mind for town hall, um, we're hoping that we can get a lot of these programming, um, uh, a lot of the programming back online by late spring, early summer. Again, remaining optimistic, but cautious in how we approach that. Um, but really looking at things like the availability for outdoor events to be up and running. Obviously we're looking to keep the economy open and moving. Um, as the weather gets nicer, we're hoping that people can, again, take to the streets, take to outdoor dining and participate in all the programming that takes place, not only from the town-wide level, but also from uh, private organizations and entities and nonprofits within town. Uh, Weathersfield uh, does a great job of, of promoting and providing opportunities for residents to do things on the weekends in the evening, and we hope to return to that soon. Uh, again, optimistic, but cautiously optimistic as we approach this. We don't wanna um, start too soon and fall right back to where we were uh, previously. Uh, a lot of the change in the weather last week has staff thinking about projects and programming. Of course, that change late Sunday and early today got cold really quickly and even had some snow uh, after a chance to be outside basically in t-shirt. Um, but um, yeah, gotta love New England, things change quickly and drastically. So every spring engineering and physical services work on seasonal maintenance as we go into the nicer weather, such as repairing parks and roadways from winter storm damage. This year is no different. Uh, right now and speaking with Derek Greger, our town engineer, he's working on about $9 million worth of projects that he's been just waiting to kick off. And as the weather starts to change, um, he's ready to get going and hit the ground and and start making an impact. This includes roadway um, improvements, drainage, bicycle and pedestrian improvements, addressing stormwater issues, and completing sidewalk repairs. Um, to address some of the tripping hazards and other unsafe conditions that are created from sidewalks. Um, and I'll just you know look at uh, Deputy Mayor Mazzarella because I, I did notice he was outside walking about a week ago, um, already back on, on track. Um, but the town has reevaluated a previous policy uh, that we had shelved for a while called slab jacking or slab raising. Uh, it's, a, it's a less costly option for the town and residents. What it does is it provides uh, a contractor to kind of drill into the um, existing sidewalk and using a spray, um, like a grout material, they can start to level off the sidewalk. So it might be equal to one that might be off um, slightly and connect the, the corners. Um, so this way it would leave it level and repaired. It's a fraction of the cost of what it would be to actually repair and or remove and replace. Um, so in consultation with Derek Greger, he felt uh, it was a good move to bring that back and allow it and we'll continue to monitor it. It's available to residents as well as the town. So we're hoping this is a more economical approach for everyone. And as always, we recommend residents do their homework before hiring a contractor or a company to provide this service. Physical services staff are moving from their winter process, although not quite yet, but they're starting to, um, into their springtime preparation for fields and other facilities, getting other facilities prepared. Uh, parks as well as working to get programming up and running. As the mayor mentioned, uh, you can access the um, current uh, spring summer guide, spring guide, um, on the website, and this runs in line with our ever-changing guidance from the state, uh, but we'll do our best to monitor as the state changes, we'll evaluate what we can do and we feel comfortable opening up to the residents. Working with the health district, social services reached out to the most vulnerable and most critical elderly residents in the town of Weathersfield over the last month um, to encourage them to attend the health district clinics that were held at the town community center. This, we received a limited supply of the vaccine and we wanted to uh, get that out to the most vulnerable population. Um, through about 2000 phone calls and emails, uh, residents were contacted through various lists that we have through town um, and social service staff had assistance from the parks and recreation staff for that outreach. 
Uh, and again, I think I mentioned this maybe at the last meeting, but uh, special thanks to individuals like Amy Miller, who uh, is our senior center coordinator who helped supervise and coordinate this process for the town. It was a huge undertaking um, and it was, uh, but important and necessary for the residents. The good news from those statistics that I'm looking at, many seniors um, that we reached out to did have appointments or had already gotten their first shots. However, those that didn't, we were able to provide them with an appointment and provide them with a shot. And we were able to leverage our existing dial-a-ride contractor to arrange transportation for those who had limited access or need um, to get there. We also leveraged our large volunteer base to reach out to these individuals. Um, so the volunteers from the senior center were out there making calls to remind people of their appointments, second shots. Part of the issue and concern that seems to be happening kind of across the United States is people sometimes don't show up or they schedule an appointment at one location, they get an earlier appointment somewhere else. So they ditch that appointment for the earlier one, but they don't cancel their other. And since it's a limited amount of vaccines and once you take them out, you have a limited time for when you can use them. Um, we've, we've kind of worked to uh, ensure that no one falls through the cracks and that um, if there's a gap, we can get that gap filled as soon as possible. And um, clinics have progressed very smoothly. Uh, the health district has done an amazing job in planning and vaccinating the elderly population. And we thank them for working with the town to do it. Uh, last check, I think we're around about 400 shots have been given out through these events through the town. Budget process well underway. Uh, all departments have provided me their asks for the upcoming year. Now I'm working with uh, them individually to do my first round of adjustments as I'm waiting for numbers related to things like health insurance, pension, OPEB and other related expenses that are outside of the town control or we don't have immediate numbers for uh, to plug in so that I can really evaluate where we are in terms of revenue and expenses. But uh, I am remaining on track for that April 5th, 2021 budget availability date based off of charter. Um, I'm not sure, again, as the mayor mentioned earlier, we're not sure what the governor is going to do, but I'm under the um, I'm running under the assumption that we will uh, be on date on time um, and there'll be no change like last year. Um, just as a, just a note for council, um, over the past few months, I've been meeting with my counterparts in Newington, Cromwell, Berlin, and Rocky Hill uh, to discuss ways that we might be able to share services, knowledge, equipment, um, and or people um, if there's gaps or deficiencies uh, to help to kind of isolate maybe cost savings along the way. Um, our neighbors share a lot of common issues with us and together we feel it's just a, you know, a make sense approach to see if there's saving opportunities that we can share with each other and one another. Um, while we might compete for businesses and for residents to live here and talk about how we have the best quality of life compared to our neighbors, I think uh, from a regional perspective, we have to look at opportunities to um, to save funding uh, and be more efficient. As part of this budget, and we did discuss it and the mayor just mentioned it at the last meeting, we're looking at alternative savings opportunities and long-term efficiencies such as uh, in waste disposal. Um, mayor, you hit the date right, uh, June 30th, 2022, or I'm calling it July 1st, 2021, we're offline with Mira, which means the clock is ticking and the costs are rising. Um, you know, even as they go into their last year, there's fees that they're looking to adjust to collect the revenue that they need um, as we deliver the service to the residents and we need to find ways to lower that. Uh, including lowering costs, uh, we, there's been ongoing meetings with MDC uh, regarding the ad valorem tax that takes place. For those of you who don't know, the MDC charges, this is kind of the quick synopsis, charges uh, the town a fee for, um, for resident sewer related costs, which is then built into the town's budget. Um, so as a result, I wanna say about three years ago, a sewer usage charge study was commissioned. It's been in process to evaluate what other affordable solutions there may be to help stabilize this fee and loser, lower costs um, to the, municipal, the participating municipalities. Uh, the most recent um, evaluation or the most recent update to that study shows five recommendations. We are vetting those further. Uh, we meaning being uh, the, the towns that make up, uh, the eight member towns that make up the MDC um, directly um, or directly providing, getting services from the MDC. 
Um, and we're trying to really narrow down those savings because across the board, not all eight uh, towns, as you look at these districts, some have incredible savings, um, you know, uh, as low as a 30% reduction in costs, while others in that same list see like a 22, 23% increase in those costs. So in order to try to figure out how to level those out so that everyone benefits at some level, um, we're doing kind of a deeper dive and, and, and really um, ripping in to see where the impact is going to be to each community and each community member. Um, Brainerd Airport, I just, just to touch on that only because we did receive a number of, um, a number of emails to be read into the record as well as a few callers on this. Um, no one from the city of Hartford, the state of Connecticut, Department of Energy and Environmental Protection or Connecticut uh, Airport Authority, CAA, has contacted the town at this point regarding the decommissioning of the airport. The only thing the town is aware of at this time is that the FAA has required these trees to be addressed due to safety issues. Um, I'm not aware of decommissioning as an option. Uh, as the town of Wethersfield, you know, we, we don't own the airport. We don't receive any taxable income directly from the airport. It's not town property. Um, to the comments from that we received, obviously it affects town residents. Um, but at this point, it's a discussion that is um, probably needs to be had with the city of Hartford and the state level first. I, uh, I'm willing to, you know, whatever the council's pleasure is. Um, but um, at this point, I've had no conversations with the mayor of Hartford or anyone from the state. Um, it was essentially news to me. Um, but we can discuss that more. Uh, Social Justice Coalition Mayor, I appreciate that, that you plugged it. Uh, it is tomorrow at 5.30. Um, you can go online and register there. You can also Google Weathersfield Social Justice Coalition and grab the link that way. Um, as a reminder, at the last meeting, we broke out into two major groups to discuss larger topics around biases within the community, um, other issues and concerns within the community, resident engagement, uh, overall developing skills to navigate uh, issues around interracial and intercultural interactions. Um, I will say attendance has been somewhere between 90 and 120 people at these events. Um, so breaking it out into uh, two larger groups to focus on um, defining an action plan with measurable out outcomes is important. And then we are going to start to, without giving away the store for what's gonna happen tomorrow, but we're gonna start to evolve uh, those groups into subcommittees um, to kind of have a deeper dive uh, within the community. And I think, yeah, it's probably enough for now. Happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Gary? Seeing none, um, Sue, town clerk correspondence or communications. Um, I don't have anything new to report right now. Okay, great. Thank you. Moving on to the agenda. We've got council action B1A. I believe we have some, uh, I don't know if we have any uh, resignations, but I believe we have uh, appointments. Council uh, action B1B. Oh, no, I take that back. We do have one. Cox Cable Television Advisory. That was uh, one that needs to be reported in. Uh, I think I'd like to make a motion to accept the resignation of Andrew Brescia, 203 Maple Street from the Cox Cable Television Advisory Council, effective February 28th. Uh, his term was 7620 to 63022. Second. Uh, second. Okay. Um, motion's been made and seconded on this resignation. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. I have it. Thank you. Now moving on to appointments. We have three appointments. I make a motion to appoint the following uh, to Laura Bloomquist to the Veterans Commission as an alternate of 55 Windmill Hill, a uh, term of 315.21 to 630.23. Uh, for the Tourism District Central Region, Laura Bloomquist, 55 Windmill Hill, 
term of 315-21 to 630-24. And to the Volunteer Firefighters Pension Committee, a treasurer to fill a vacancy, Thomas Fitzpatrick, 40 Whipperwell Way, and it's an indefinite uh, term. Second. Thank you. Uh, motion's been made and seconded on these appointments. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Ayes have it. Thank you for those, Mr. Deputy Mayor. And moving on to, I think, council item number B4A. If I'm not mistaken, we had Derek on. Line. This is the um, crack ceiling bid for the project, um, number of projects that are going on in town on this. Uh, I believe Derek can further explain this, uh, but it's something that we do every year um, to prepare the roads for, uh, um, well, somewhat to repair the roads uh, from this past winter, but also prepare for uh, spring and summer driving. Mr. Gregor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of council. Um, here, I'm here tonight to discuss the annual crack seal program, as was mentioned. Um, this is a program that's a preventative maintenance measure that we use to extend the life of the roads. Um, as presented at an earlier meeting uh, I had with you, you know, I've explained that the town and many municipalities use uh, CROG bid solicitations uh, for contracting for this type of work. It's very similar to the state contracts, uh, typically because there's a number of uh, you know people that would utilize contracts the prices are typically lower due to the higher volume it is a little different than state contracts because with krog they don't actually contract with these um, bidders they just solicit pricing so then we go the extra step and, and contract with them directly based on their bid prices so tonight i'm here seeking approval to issue a hundred thousand dollar purchase order which is what we normally spend on our crack seal maintenance every year um, to UCL USA out of Bloomfield. Um, you may remember for many years, the town has been using seal coating incorporated, also known as Indus. They have a, a polymer crumb rubber modified sealant that we've been using for a lot of years that uh, seems to work very well. Um, however, looking at the bids this year, um, UCL is substantially lower. I think they're about 20% lower in pricing on that for a very similar uh, fiber modified sealant. So we've reviewed the material specs, um, you know, based from what we can see, uh, we feel it should perform similar to what seal coating has been applying. Um, also, we, we checked references with other municipalities that have been using it and um, references for the product were good. References for the contractor were, were generally good from the other towns too. So um, therefore, just given the, that substantially lower in cost, um, I think it would be worthwhile to uh, utilize them this year, you know, evaluate how the product works. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions anyone might have. Any questions for Derek on this? Mr. Deputy Mayor. Yeah, yeah. Derek, I just want to make sure we're not going to be putting that uh, dusty mulch type uh, material on this crack ceiling that everybody had problems with. That's correct. That was a mulch seal product the town used to use. Um, we, we don't use it. This is this is a very similar product what we usually use. It's uh, it's just it's a regular um, hot applied sealant. But this, this particular when they have fiber in it, it tends to um, fill the cracks better and be longer lasting. Or at least that's been the experience that we've had with it. So it's worked pretty well. But to answer your question, no, this is not the, the mulch seal. So Thanks. there shouldn't be that issue with the dust and dirt. Any other questions for Derek on this? Seeing none, uh, can I get a motion to approve this item? So moved. Second. Uh, do we have to give an actual motion and relay the information or is it simply Make a motion to issue a new purchase order for 100,000 to use seal USA to complete asphalt crack sealing of roads using the hot pour method. Second, we'll there let the mayor go. make the motion. There we go. 
Uh, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Abstain. Ayes have it. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, for that, Derek. Um, and I believe we have item B4B, and Peter is on for the um, grant. Yes, I am. Good evening, uh, council mayor and town manager. Um, uh, in front of you tonight, I have a, a simple request to accept a small grant from Connecticut Humanities and I'll allow the town manager to execute the agreements associated with it. Uh, in summary, it's a, a $4,999 grant um, that we will match with uh, some cash and in-kind services to expand the Heritage Walk. Uh, we're working with Trinity Church, uh, the Great Meadows Conservation Trust and the Old Weathersfield Shopkeepers to add uh, three locations to the Heritage Walk. Uh, and this grant will allow us to uh, stretch uh, some of our local resources and allow us to do that. We were awarded the grant about a week ago um, and um, it's a simple matter of uh, accepting and then signing the associated documents with the grant. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Gillespie? Mr. Deputy Mayor. Yeah, uh, Peter, are these uh, gonna look exactly like the uh, signage that's at other uh, locations or? So the, the location at Trinity Church and the location on Main Street uh, nearby Village Pizza will look exactly like uh, the others on Main Street, which is a granite post and a, a steel frame. Um, the location at uh, the wood parcel, which is the Great Meadow Conservation Trust, uh, they have asked for something that has maybe a little bit more natural feelings to it. We haven't exactly specified uh, what that would be, but we're um, agreeable to working with them given the environment that those signs will be located in. Uh, the graphics, however, will all be the same. Uh, it's simply a matter that the post itself and the base itself may be a little bit uh, different than what you see um, you know, on the main part of the Heritage Walk, primarily on Main Street. So we've left that up in the air a little bit. I, I kind of got a little sticker shock when I saw the price. It's, uh, <clears throat> is that the kind of money that we spent on all the other signs or is it just- No, they're actually, or? because of the economies and we're only doing a few of them. The last time around we did over 20 and we uh, obviously got a discount because of the volume. This time around, um, it's such a small number. Uh, it's a special, unique design. So um, unfortunately it's in essence, almost double the price that we experienced the first time around. And, and obviously some time has gone by too, so. Yeah. Thanks for clarifying. Sure. Any other questions? Councilman Forrest. Get, get this on the table for action. I'm going to move to authorize the town manager, Gary Evans, to execute any and all documents. Hang, hang on one. I actually had some other, I had a question. I well, just you, opened it too. You, you could still uh, ask a question. We're just, okay. getting, just getting it in front of the council to discuss. Got it. I'm going to move to authorize town manager Gary Evans to execute any and all documents required to accept the humanity, Connecticut Humanities Quick Grant in the amount of $4,999. Okay. Um, any other questions from anybody before I go? In the so, seconded. Okay. I think you have to second it, and then you can have a conversation. Correct. Yeah. It's a no second. Right. Motion's been made and seconded. Okay, for discussion, Peter. These are for three signs along Main Street. Uh, and one. One in front of Trinity Church, one in front of Village Pizza, which will serve as a business directory. Uh, we've had, we've contracted with Phil Lohman. He's done just a phenomenal graphic, an aerial view of Old Weathersfield. And then down at the wood parcel, there will be three uh, additional signs. So in total, uh, there will be five signs at three different locations. Okay, five signs, three locations. And, and are we using the same company who did the, um, the 20 other signs a couple of years ago? Yes, we are. They're still in business. Yep. Uh, is there much in the way of design work that needs to be done? Can they replicate what they're we doing? 
we've hired the same group of people, the same graphic designer. He's still practicing. Um, we're using the same sign designer. So uh, we've, uh, uh, the, I guess the old team is back. So, um, so we were able to get the, uh, everybody back uh, on this project again. Okay. And then um, finally, HDC approval. Do we need HDC approval on these or any other type of uh, boards or commission approval? That's part of the process we'll have to go through once we finalize everything and we, we nail down the exact locations. We will be visiting the Historic District Commission for approval, which we don't anticipate a problem with because we're using the same materials and, and uh, matching the graphics exactly like we've done in the past. Okay. Any other questions? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Uh, abstain. Ayes have it. Thank you. Thank you. And if the council could indulge me for a second, we are going to um, propose to a motion to open the agenda for what we had heard earlier from the superintendent uh, about the phase three um, study that needs to be done. Uh, so if I can get a motion to open the agenda for this. Motion to open, open the agenda. Second. Uh, Sue, the motion by Councilman Biggs, seconded by Councilman O'Connor. Um, we have, you know, as you heard the discussion from uh, Mr. Emmett on phase one, two, and three. Yeah, Water Mayor, I think you got a vote to open the agenda. Oh, yes. <laughs> All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Aye, so have it. Thank you. Um, Gary, has this been given to all councilmen nope what you i can bring it up on the, uh hold on i can bring it up on the screen if that's easier although i'm missing my piece uh, <coughs> well Okay. So as we heard from the superintendent, uh, this is a phase three study of 60,800, I believe. Um, the Board of Ed, uh, the previous Board of Ed had uh, approved phase one study in, um, I believe the summer of, yeah, it's up there. So summer of 2018 for phase one, um, that's where they, they did the assessment for the five current uh, elementary schools. Uh, they did an enrollment study at that point. I believe they are going to look at a second enrollment study um, at this current juncture with phase three. Um, this of course is the, the plan or long range plan for uh, the five elementary schools. As we heard, the plan is to um, renovate as new uh, two of them and um, to uh, additionally, um, 
completely rebuild the two others and then bring Charles Wright offline. Um, these will be done, uh, take probably about 10 years to do if, uh, if the um, public and, and voters decide that this is the way they want to proceed on this. Um, phase two was uh, also done under the um, previous uh, Board of Ed uh, administration. Uh, they did additional site studies um, around the uh, existing buildings and uh, where the proposed new buildings would be. Um, unfortunately, uh, about this time two years ago, uh, they, they halted the, the process or the progress of um, phase two. Um, I think it was because of some budgetary concerns that had arisen at that point. Um, we've been asked by uh, the board this year to, um, to bring that phase three study back to the table. Um, as we, uh, we heard, um, you know, Superintendent Mike Emmett continues to uh, look to that as a, uh, a scenario over the next decade to um, not only help uh, with um, the school buildings, but also to um, uh, update and upgrade our um, learning for our students here in town. Um, they do have a 2% fund. It's a statutorily um, uh, created account for uh, boards of eds and districts throughout the state. Uh, they do have, uh, I forget the exact amount of money in their 2% fund. Uh, but they surely have 60,000 in there for, for this. And I believe uh, under our um, town rules that uh, um, even though it's their money, the uh, council has to vote to um, release that funds to the board uh, to, to do this study. Um, if uh, you have any questions, uh, either I or uh, Gary can answer those for you right now. I can't see anybody. Mayor, uh, it looks like the motion that you're looking for, I'm, I did raise my hand, I didn't see anyone else, sorry. Yeah. Uh, Let me the, see if I can bring, I can see you now. Yep. Motion, so the motion is, you're, look, you're looking for. Yep. Is it for a certain amount of a certain amount of money, like not to exceed? We didn't suppose sort of get that rather than a free for all in the two percent fund. No, the motion to award a change order to Colliers International, absent a competitive solicitation in the amount of sixty thousand eight hundred, to complete phase three of the elementary school long range construction plan master plan. Is that your motion right now, Mayor? Yeah. Okay. Second. Okay. Now open it up to discussion. Does anybody have any questions on this? Councilman Forrest. Thanks, Mayor. Um, I think it's absolutely the right step uh, in our infrastructure, uh, moving our schools uh, into, the, into the current age and also allocate, uh, recognizing that the school's uh, environment has changed significantly over the last 50 years, both from a technology standpoint and from a pedagogical standpoint. So um, it's clear that uh, I think redistricting and moving from five to four will also generate a lot of savings as far as the efficiency of delivery of service, uh, perhaps limiting the amount uh, of, uh, I could definitely see if we went from five principals to four principals with the same size school, we might be able to get some efficiencies there. Um, and uh, also if we, wanna, if we want a first class town, we need to have first class items and not be afraid to build them and create them. And that's important. So I uh, fully support this particular motion as we move our town from uh, into um, the next uh, few years so we can provide those uh, high quality services and high quality buildings and increase the quality of life and be attractive to, uh, to our neighbors and to families that want to move here. Okay. Thank you, Councilman. Anybody else? I'm sorry if I can't see you. Oh, Deputy Mayor. Yep, oh, you're muted, Tom. Sorry about that. Do we need to be concerned about the fact that the uh, it's not a competitive bid or it's their money to do what they want with? That was a question I 
Gary, did you have a conversation with Mr. Emmett about that earlier today? Yep, did some research and spoke with uh, also Mike O'Neill, who handles procurement for us. Uh, and that's a good question. That's why the, uh, the motion is specifically for a change order um, per section 713B of the charter. Um, there's allowances for exceptions uh, to the bidding requirements for a number of things, including professional services. This would fall under a professional service. Um, the fact that it is phase three and they've handled phase one and two, we're calling it a change order more so than we are calling it a, um, uh, a requirement to bid. Um, and it is for professional service. So you do as council have the authority to, um, to make this motion or to make this move. Thanks for the clarification. Yep. Anybody else with any questions? I, I uh, have, yep. Thanks, Mike. Um, so I just want to clarify that this 2% fund, this is the Board of Ed's fund, and we don't really have a, it, I mean, we have to approve it, but it's not something we can say no to because they're entitled to use this um, money for anything regarding, you know, educational purposes. Is that correct under state statute? I believe that is the case. I will defer to the two former members of boards of ed if you can provide any clarity, but I believe the 2% fund can be used at the discretion of the board for any educational um, expenditures. Okay, so I don't, I don't, you know, think this is the right time to get into the merits of the, you know, the, the referendum and all that, but um, I, I think they are entitled to spend the money in the way they see fit. And I look forward to a, a vigorous discussion of uh, once phase three is complete and before, you know, anything moves forward. But I think that from the way I see this state statute, I believe that they are entitled to this money and they can spend it how they see fit as long as it's related to education so i'm I think we can just vote on this but uh we don't need to get into the merits of um you know rebuilding all the elementary schools right now correct any other comments or questions on this if not can i get a motion i already did the motion can i get a second you already got a second. Oh, who seconded? I did. I did. Oh, I was setting okay. you up for success there. <laughs> okay, I know. I'm looking. I I still have Gary's screen on top, and just you guys, I have to toggle down below. There we go. Okay, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Abstain. Motion carries. Moving on. I think we did all that. We don't have any ordinances or resolutions or appointments. Minutes of March 1st, that was in the uh, packet that we had all received. If anybody's got any questions or corrections on the minutes, if not, can I get a motion to approve the minutes of March 1st? No move. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. And any abstention? Okay. And do we have anybody on the caller list for the second public comment? Looks like we have one caller, Mayor, 860-563-6923. Uh, good evening again. This is Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. Um, you know, I'm, I'm listening to this issue of uh, rebuild new schools, uh, I should say, renovate several schools, uh, rebuild two of them, and uh, all these other costs that I'm hearing about going on here. And, and you know, Mayor, I, I, I recall not long ago, 
where you were in the minority sitting on the town council, and you were squawking about us approaching the 40 mil rate. Um, and here now you're in charge, and we're at the 41 mil rate already. And uh, as, as we're going forward, it, it looks to me as if uh, we're going to be much higher in a short while when I start hearing about renovations and, and building new schools and, and all of that. And uh, it really makes me wonder what who's, who's going to be here to pay all these bills. And, and as I think about that, I, 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 again, I go back to we need to find a way of controlling our costs. And, and, and you just cannot continue to spend. And that's really what I'm hearing tonight. Uh, if you pass this thing for uh, uh, new, new schools, renovating schools, we're going to be at 50. We're going to be at 55 in, in, in the matter of uh, a few years once that gets started, because that's big money. And what, what happens, you know, I don't know who's going to be here to pay all of this, these bills. And uh, I, I really think you should consider cutting back. I also think you should be looking for ways of reducing our cost here in town. Um, and, and, the, and, the, and, you know, I agree with this thing about the trash after listening to that woman last week. Uh, that, that That's not doable at all. But... Uh, uh, I really believe we need to do some real heavy soul searching to find ways of cutting our cost. And, you know, I've mentioned in the past that our school system, and I'm, unfortunately, uh, when I tuned in tonight, I missed what the superintendent said the increase was going to be. So I don't even know what that is at the moment. I'll have to replay uh, to find out what it was. But the fact is, I, I heard him talking about bringing on new, new, new staff and new people here, and new, you know, it, it's just more and more spending, and there's no control at all going on here. And as we, as as we, uh, uh, as I talk about, we got to not only find ways of cutting costs. You, you know, you're even talking with in the past. You've talked about finding ways of increasing revenue. And, and here I, I'm giving you a number of options for the Keisha farm, yet nobody's talking about that, and not from your side or not from the council side, I should say. And, and really, you should be talking about that as an option. Um, I, I, I just don't know where you're going to go except for your mill rate's going to continue rising very rapidly as, as I'm hearing all of this great stuff you want to do. You know, the school system has operated this year kind of like a, um, uh, you know, without the students in the classroom, it's online. Why aren't we doing something to cut costs and, and, and make our seniors and our juniors take full-time online classes and, and, and purchase from top teachers in the country uh, the classes that these, these students need to get ahead? Uh, where they, they they could listen to a top-rated teacher throughout the whole semester for whatever class they were, they were in, for juniors and seniors. And that way there we could eliminate having them even in the school building. We could, we could sh you know, shrink our building somewhat. And, and, but I don't hear that. And, and really, I, I, would be, I would hope that you would be approaching the state of Connecticut and, and do some kind of a, let's, let's get the state to buy those presentations and all the schools across the country, across the state would be able to tap in and, and, and use this for their most successful students like the seniors and the juniors and, uh, and, and reduce our cost because we've got to do something about reducing. And, and from what I'm hearing tonight, we're not, we're not even thinking about that. And we're not hearing any discussion about how to reduce. You know, I was hoping you'd come in with a nice reduction uh, in our budget. I'm not hearing anything there either. So you're going to hear from me if you don't. But uh, I would hope that you would start to consider some of this. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you, Mr. Young. 
and Sue, I believe if you could just, uh, there were a couple letters that had come in or emails that had come in. Okay. All right. Um, the first one is from Peter Hinman, 31 State Street. Mr. Hinman and his wife are in support of the decommissioning of Brainerd Airport. The noise multiple times a day is very disturbing to them. They are opposed to cutting down trees and lengthening the runway. They would like the town council to pursue this on their behalf. Mary Breton, 209 Clovercrest Road. Ms. Breton is in opposition to the CAA plan to cut the mature trees on the 30 acres at the Weathersfield Cove and along the Connecticut River. She feels the plan will have a harmful impact on the environment and she urges the town council to stand in opposition of the CAA plan. James and Doris Stamos, 504 Main Street. Mr. and Mrs. Stamos support the decommissioning of Brainerd Airport. They cite the increase in noise, which causes the vibration of their house and its contents. Their complaints to the noise complaint line have been ignored and the pilots are not adhering to the voluntary agreement to fly over the river. They would like the town council to pursue decommissioning Brainerd Airport. Maria Alfonso, 256 Broomfield Road. Ms. Alfonso is in support of decommissioning of, of Brainerd Airport. She states the lack of profitability, maintenance costs, environmental impact, and noise are serious concerns. She would like the mayor and the councilors to advocate for the residents regarding decommissioning of Brainerd Airport. Michelle Lavoie. Ms. Lavoie is in favor of Brainerd Airport. Some of the aviation business services it offers are concierge, fueling, ground support, aircraft repair, flight school training, aircraft sales, aircraft sales and rental, car rental, and a restaurant. She states it contributes to the economy and success of local businesses serving Central Connecticut. Connecticut Aerotech School, a state technical school, is also located there. Diana Bonehart, 6 Howard Avenue. Ms. Bonehart states she has seen and felt the planes from Brainerd Airport for 56 years. Expansion of the airport would cause environmental damage. The airport also loses money and benefits few. She is urging the town council to support the decommissioning of Brainerd Airport. Sarah Hinman. Ms. Hinman states that the noise level of the planes and jets are intolerable. It is not uncommon for more than 100 planes to fly overhead in one day. The noise makes enjoying outside activities impossible. She's urging the council to support decommissioning Brainerd Airport. Peter Denegre, 527 Main Street. Mr. Denegre states that the pilots are not adhering to the policy to fly over the Connecticut River and are continuing to fly over the backyards of the homes on Main Street. He has called the telephone number given to the residents to call if there was a problem and has never received a return call. He is requesting the town council to join the state delegation to ask to close the airport and find a more suitable use for the property. John Gallivan, 72 Westwood Drive. Mr. Gallivan is opposed to the Brainerd Airport expansion. He would like the town council to join with our legislative delegation to support the decommissioning of Brainerd Airport. Rita Ann Owen, 42 Wells Farm Drive. Ms. Owen states that she supports decommissioning Brainerd Airport. The noise has increased during the 40 years that she has lived in Weathersfield. The pilots ignore the flight patterns for noise abatement. She feels that the planes, plans for tree cutting indicate that the airport is looking to expand, bringing more noise in the future. Richard Benfield, 30 Belcher Road. Mr. Benfield states the following, that to close Brainerd, Road, close Brainerd and tell them to use the airport to the north, stop using Main Street as a flight aid and use the river as directed, and do not cut down trees, plant more trees and make Weathersfield in Arbor City as advertised. Douglas Sachs. Mr. Sachs, Sachs states that a facility can lose money but still maintain significant value for the region. 
the Fortune 500 companies that are based in Hartford County make use of the airport and are very important to the area. Weathersfield residents should consider the bigger picture and recognize the greatest good for the greatest number. Cindy and Howard Greenblatt, 35 Broad Street. Mr. and Mrs. Greenblatt state that Brainerd Airport is a terrible neighbor. The plans to cut trees and expand the runway are a threat to Weathersfield residents, community, cove, and economic vitality. They urge Mayor Rell and the town council to join with the members of the state delegation in favor of decommissioning the airport. Susan Grady, 25 Westlook Road. Ms. Grady states that she's in favor of decommissioning Brainerd Airport. She is against commercial flights and the cutting down of 30 acres of trees. Added air traffic, noise, and pollution will adversely affect the quality of life in parts of Old Weathersfield. Patrick Hayes, 451 Main Street. Mr. Hayes states that the low flying planes are scary and obtrusive and do not avoid the noise sensitive area that was established years ago. He feels supporting the closure and decommissioning of Brainerd Airport as soon as possible would be a great quality of life improvement for all the weathers for all of Weathersfield, especially in old Weathersfield. Janice de Roberts, 87 Meadowgate. Ms. De Roberts is requesting that the town council support the Weathersfield delegation in their proposal to decommission Brainerd Airport for the sake of the environment and for the safety of our town. Martha Keneally, 12 Fairmont Street. Ms. Keneally is in support of decommissioning Brainerd Airport. She feels the riverfront property has the potential to be transformed into a vibrant commercial development that can increase property values, create jobs and business opportunities and be beneficial to the town. She is urging Mayor Rell and the town council to request that the Connecticut Airport Authority decommission Brainerd. Ann Starbuck to Kelly Avenue. Ms. Starbuck states that she has lived in Weathersfield for 45 years. The constant flyovers by planes and helicopters are very scary and most so low that the call letters can be read. Her windows rattle when her house is flown over when they are supposed to fly over the Connecticut River and I-91. Closing the airport would be a blessing. Kevin Sullivan, 79 Wright Road. Mr. Sullivan feels the decommissioning of Brainerd Airport would create the potential for economic development. It would also create environmental and quality of life benefits if the proposed clear cutting of the Folly Brook Preserve was avoided. He encourages town council to work with our legislative delegation to support decommissioning Brainerd Airport. Carolyn Owen, 32 Belmont Street. Ms. Owen states that Brainerd Airport is detrimental to the Weathersfield community. The noise pollution is incredibly intrusive in the neighborhoods as well as old Weathersfield business area. Cutting acres of trees would forever alter the environment for the worse. She is asking the town council to join with the state legislators to support the decommission of Brainerd Airport. That's all I have. Okay. Thank you. Went through that. Um, Gary, do we have we have an executive session tonight on the union collective bargaining update? Yes, sir. I see Ken Plum in. He just logged in. Yep. Yep. So we'll need a motion to go into motion. executive session. Can I get a motion to go into executive session? I'll move. Okay. Motion by Forrest and seconded by O'Connor. Okay. And a vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Ayes have it. Okay, give me a moment and I will pass over the hosting to the other computer.